for our next special address entitled India, Collective Intelligence and the Next Stage of Globalization. We are honored to have with us James Crabtree, Associate Professor of Practice, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and author of The Billionaire Raj. To introduce him further, please welcome Babar Ali Khan, Director of Investments, Kazana India Advisors. Babar, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Back there, I want you all to return the greeting. Good afternoon. Now, I know this is the post-lunch session, uh, and you may not be envying my task of trying to get everyone up. After a sumptuous lunch, the post-lunch coma syndrome may have set in. Everyone just wants to sit back, relax, you know, just detach, sometimes maybe even meditate. But, but I promise you, the KMF organizing committee has got for you a session where we promise to wake you up, to perk you up. It's about a topic, a land which you're all very familiar of and even fond of, the land of Shah Rukh Khan <laughs> and Salman Khan and Anna Rajni Kant, yeah? and of elephants and snakes and snake charmers if you go with the stereotypes. I mean, that's no longer true, but you know, that's the stereotype. My name's Babar Khan. Sorry, Shah Rukh couldn't be here today. He sends his regards, though. <laughs> and I uh, look after Khazana's investments in the Indian public equities markets. And for those of you know, uh, who know the Indian public markets uh, may appreciate, my job can be more exciting and interesting than Shah Rukh Khan's at times. Yeah. But I'm here to introduce to you today a most fascinating person, uh, a person who's done myriad roles in his career, Professor James Crabtree, who will be talking to you. A round of applause for, for James, please. Now, James, like I said, has done a myriad of roles. You would have read his bio. He was public policy advisor to the prime ministers of UK, two of them, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. I'm sure it was not easy. Uh, then he became a journalist, has written for famous publications, such as the New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times. Uh, he was based in Mumbai as bureau chief for The Financial Times and lived there with his family for five years. That's where his son was born. And uh, he was so uh, enamored by India that he decided to uh, give his son even a, an, an Indian name. So his son's middle name, you may not know, is Vishwanathan, uh, Alexander Vishwanathan Crabtree. And uh, that's after the Indian chess legend, uh, Vishwanathan Anand, because James is a great chess aficionado as well. Uh, then uh, after his stint at uh, Mumbai, he switched to academia. He's a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew uh, College of Public Policy. And while doing all these myriad roles, he found time to be an author. He writes extensively. And his most recent book is the best-selling book on India called The Billionaire Raj. And if you haven't read it, I say this as an Indian, you take it from me as an Indian. If you haven't read it, you must. Get yourself a copy if you haven't one. James will be around tomorrow to sign copies as well, if you're interested. And in the book, he has beautifully and so insightfully captured the complexity of India and brought out the insights. Now, an, in, an outsider cannot do it without living in India for five years. Some of those insights, I tell you, I'm an Indian. Even I found profound. And you must read the book. Uh, I, I, would, I would strongly recommend that. India is such a complex civilization. It's 5,000 years of, of history. It's got layers upon layers of diversity and complexity. You know, and as, as the country uh, is changing from the old to the new, the new there's no, it's not that new layers are coming in and the old layers are being replaced. The new layers are coming on top of the old layers and sometimes on top and sometimes getting interwoven into the old layers. It makes it even more complex. The, I mean, we are 50 years or 100 years from now, it may not be, but today it certainly is. And trying to make sense of that, you know, hats off to you, James. And today he's here to talk about us, uh, talk to us about the experiences he's had in India, uh, the insights he's picked up from there, 
for the collective intelligence and the collective brain of India as he sees it evolving, especially the challenges, and India faces many, the challenges in exploiting its potential, on which, unfortunately, India has been a lot slower than a lot of its peers. And he will then share with us insights of takeaways for the Asian economies and Asian countries as he sees it. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I leave the floor open for James Crabtree. With a big round of applause for James, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Baba, for that excessively generous introduction. Uh, thank you to Kazana for hosting me, and thank you to all of you for making it in after lunch and still looking reasonably awake. Um, I'm going to do a simple thing here. I'm going to tell three stories from the book that I wrote, The Billionaire Raj, and then I'm going to try and make three points which link the book to the theme of the conference uh, introduced in Joe Henrik's session this morning, Building Our Collective Brain. But before I do that, Baba was kind enough to mention uh, Bollywood. One of the things I did in India was to have a bit part in a Salman Khan movie. Uh, if any of you have seen Kick, uh, I was British diplomat number two. Uh, it's a, a smaller part than British diplomat number one, who was played by a German. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I did think it was important that in a session about India, we have a little bit of Bollywood music. And so in order that I don't have to go over the basic plot of the book, I'm going to show you a two-minute video complete with pumping Bollywood soundtrack. Uh, and it goes like this. India is currently the world's fastest growing major economy. But over the last 20 years, it has also become one of the most corrupt and unequal. So how did India turn into a billionaire Raj? This is the home of the richest man in India, Mukesh Ambani, in Mumbai, India's financial capital. Often called the world's first billion dollar home, it is 160 meters tall and boasts a range of luxurious additions. Yet, all around Mumbai, you see slums which house around half the residents in India's richest city. To understand this huge gap between India's rich and poor, you must go back to 1947. After winning independence from Britain, India shut off its economy, building a closed, statist system of license, permits and tariffs often known as License Raj. It was only more than 40 years later in 1991 that India ended this era of central planning and reopened itself to the world. Since 1991, India has introduced a range of economic reforms, helping its economy to grow rapidly and lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty. A new era of globalization began. But India's boom came at a cost, as three big problems emerged, the first being the inequality that came with the rise of a new super-rich class. India's hyper-wealthy grew more quickly than in almost any country in history. Billionaires have ballooned in number from just a small handful in the late 1990s to around 120 today. In Russia, they were known as oligarchs. In India, some call them boligarchs. Over the same period, India's top 10% of income owners has thrived while the share of the middle 40%, the middle class, has declined sharply. India's second problem is corruption. A series of mega-corruption scandals hit the country from the mid-2000s, pushing India's position higher up in global corruption rankings. Finally, the last two decades revealed a third problem, a boom and bust cycle in India's investment model as billionaire tycoons borrowed recklessly and banks lent aggressively during the 2000s, only to see projects come unstuck, leaving banks with $150 billion or more of bad loans today. These three problems of the inequality and the super-rich, corruption and investment form the heart of the billionaire Raj. However... Now I'm going to stop there. There's another minute or so you can go and watch on YouTube if you want. 
So I want to tell three stories which link to those three points, which are the, the structure of the book about the rise of the Indian super rich, crony capitalism, and debt and investment. But I want to make an underlying point about globalization. So the title of my talk today is India, Collective Intelligence, and the Next Stage of Globalization. And in a sense, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the last stage of globalization, the period of hyper-globalization, which ran from probably 1981 in China uh, through to the global financial crisis. And, and the three stories that I tell are connected to that. What we're now interested in is the next stage of globalization and where this goes from here, what we can learn from the mistakes of the past. So the front cover, not of the book that was in some of your packages, but the American edition of the book, features this building, Antilia. Those of you who have been in Mumbai will know it well. This is the home of Mukesh Ambani. And I have a confession here, which is as I lived in Mumbai, I became pretty obsessed with Mukesh Ambani and his house. Um, the billion dollar home, the very first day I arrived in Mumbai in 2011, I was picked up by the Financial Times' driver in the old airport in the, the north of the city, drove down the peninsula, and the only time the driver spoke to me during the one and a half hour traffic strewn journey was to point out of the front window and say, sir, look, the Ambani house, as it came up ahead of us on Pedo Road in Midtown Mumbai. So this is what the house looks like for those of you who are not familiar. This is 170 meters tall. It's a, a home for, a, well, it was a family of five, uh, Mukesh Ambani, his wife, and his three children, although some of the children have since moved out. Um, it has uh, allegedly a snow room, which is a sauna in reverse where you can go and cool off from the heat. It has a hotel-style ballroom similar to this one on the ground floor. Uh, it has six uh, stories for parking. It has a basement that has its own indoor football and basketball pitch. It's an unusual and remarkable building, and it tells you something very interesting about what is happening in India, that even in all of the other cities around the world that represent the extraordinary accumulation of wealth that has been produced during the, the great age of hyper-globalization, in London, in Moscow, in New York, even here in Kuala Lumpur, nowhere is there a building quite like this, a, a vertical palace fit for a tycoon, a, a new Maharaja. Now, according to the Bloomberg and Forbes rankings, um, not just the richest man in India, but the richest man in Asia. And Mukesh Ambani embodied uh, um, both a period of great change, but also to some degree continuity in India. This is a country that opened itself up in 1991, uh, but for the period of its reopening, there has been one piece of continuity amongst all of this change, which is that the richest person in the country has always had the surname Ambani. It was initially his father, Dhirubhai Ambani, and now Mukesh Ambani is, is and remains the preeminent tycoon in the country. But he represents a much broader change. It was mentioned um, in the video of the rise of a super wealthy class. When India became uh, or, or opened up in 1991, it was a relatively equal country in the sense that it didn't really have a globally comparable super rich. And now it does have people who can build houses um, a little bit like this one here. Um, the number of billionaires in India has shot up, as it said on the video. India has created billionaire wealth at the very pinnacle of its society uh, more quickly than almost any country other than Russia, much more quickly than China did at the similar point in its history. And I suppose one of the things I'm going to talk about today uh, is the question of whether India can repeat what China has done in terms of growth. India at the moment, for those of you who invest in the markets, will know that, uh, in fact, that video is a little bit out of date. Uh, it was put together last year when India was indeed the fastest growing major economy in the world. It's now hit a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a sticky patch. Nonetheless, the influence of the new billionaire class um, is considerable um, to the point where this image went round on uh, WhatsApp suggesting that even Mukesh Ambani's driver had decided to build. You, you, you can see the similarity. So influential has been the architecture of Antilia 
that, that it now stretches right into the lower classes. I actually came to rather admire the architecture of the building. It certainly divides people. I felt like having decided to write about this man, I was suffering from an architectural version of Stockholm Syndrome in which I, I, just, I came to rather like the, the, the house and how it looked. But the more important point is that as India has created this rapid wealth at the pinnacle of its society, so uh, this has in many ways been a, a very positive development and it's one that's intimately connected to globalization. That India's very rapid process of re-globalization that I chart in the book, which began not really in 1991, when the country reopened, but really began with a vengeance in the middle of the 2000s. That was when the number of billionaires went from a, a small handful to a few dozen to more now than 120 or 130 in a very short period of time. That was the, the height of the, the, the great moderation, the period below the, before the financial crisis, in which suddenly India's tycoon class had access to international capital, bank loans, uh, and foreign investment at a level that they had previously long been denied. And so the story that I tell in the book about the rise of the Indian super rich is one that is intimately bound up with India's story of re-globalization. So you can see here, again, the image that was in the video of the number of these, uh, these bollygarks, a phrase which I did not, a word which I didn't coin, but I at least did something uh, to popularize. And so this leads to a somewhat unhelpful debate about the nature of Indian inequality. Um, we should point out that actually India has done rather better than many people recognize at the reduction of extreme poverty. Um, extreme poverty will pretty soon simply be a, a phenomenon uh, of sub-Saharan Africa with only small patches in South and Southeast Asia. But it's, you can say that that is true and at the same time note that India has become a dramatically less equal country. Um, I think in part because we all recognize that India is already quite a stratified society, stratified by, by region, by caste, by religion. It's a little bit difficult to grasp quite how much more unequal it has become and how much of the wealth that has been created in India uh, has gone to the very top. Now we're in Southeast Asia, home of the, the crazy rich Asians, a film I saw not once, not twice, but three times. And so this should be a story that is familiar to everyone in this room. But it's also a worrying one from a development point of view. If you start out very early in your development process, India is a country with a GDP per capita of about $2,000, um, far below Malaysia, below China. If you start out of a very, very unequal country at this stage, and you tend to get more unequal in the early stage of your development, the odds are that you will end up as a highly unequal, highly stratified country. And so part of the argument I was trying to make in the book is that at this early stage, India should care more than it often does in the public discourse about the inequality that has come along with this extreme, uh, with, with this era of rapid wealth creation. A few more graphs, you can see India on the right-hand side um, and how dramatic this change has been as India has uh, re-globalized. And to give you a sense of how rapid that re-globalization has been, I, I think that perhaps not the people here who trade equities in India or who invest into India, there's still an image out there that compared to China, compared to Malaysia, compared to Vietnam, that India is a relatively unglobalized economy with high trade barriers. That's actually not true anymore. The, the story I tell in the book is about a, a, a fundamental change in the Indian economy in which it has re-globalized very rapidly. A 17% ratio of trade in goods and services to GDP in the early 1990s, 60% in 2016, high, well higher than the United States, higher than China, uh, higher than most countries other than those in uh, than trade-dependent small, small economies like Malaysia or where I live um, in Singapore. So that's the first story, Mukesh Ambani, the richest man in India. Um, I, I now want to let you into a journalistic secret uh, to do with the second story. Um, one of the things that I learned in my five years of being a foreign correspondent was a, a tip that I now pass on to people who want to be journalists, and that tip is always visit the bathroom. 
whenever you go and meet somebody interesting, whenever you interview them, make sure you take a break from the interview or before or after you go and visit the toilet because it tells you something interesting about an institution or an individual, what they happen to put in the most private room in the house or the office. And it was a, a tip that I was particularly glad to have followed when interviewing not the richest man in India, but probably the most controversial tycoon in India, a gentleman by the name of Vijay Malia, the promoter or tycoon behind Kingfisher Beer and Kingfisher Airlines. I went to London to meet him. He now lives in London in, in exile, having had to leave India uh, for his various misdeeds. He, he fled the country and now lives in exile in the UK. It was said to me by a friend of mine that if I got into trouble uh, writing this book, if I was sued or the Indian government took against me, it would be okay because I could just take exile in London like all the rest of the Indian billionaires. Um, and I, the day I went to see Vijay Malia, he was feeling very sorry for himself. So his business affairs had collapsed. He'd had to leave the country under a cloud. He self-describes himself as the poster child for India's problems of crony capitalism, which is the, the second theme of my book, and how India's age of rapid re-globalization came hand in hand with a very rapid uh, increase in corruption and crony capitalism. And so he unburdened himself to me. This is the second chapter in the book, probably the most fun chapter in the book. He told me all of his troubles over a three-hour interview in which he drank and smoked copiously, and I listened with my tape recorder. And at one point, I excused myself to go and visit the bathroom. And this is what I found. Vijay Malia's golden toilet. Um, uh, uh, the, the toilet, this was in a, a, a mansion that he, was, he had on the edge of Regent's Park, um, a house where even the chandeliers had chandeliers. And I walked into this bathroom which had a, a golden toilet, a golden toilet roll holder, uh, not golden towels or sadly golden toilet paper, but there were gold embossed letters saying VJ on the towels. Um, and this became the, the story in the book that the Indian press liked almost more than any other. So the story of VJ Malia and his golden toilet um, became the, the thing that people asked me most about. It even made it into the, the local languages that this most charismatic of Indian billionaires, a man who, if you want to think about his business affairs, he's a little bit like a cross between Richard Branson and Hugh Hefner, or uh, <laughs> Captain Jack Sparrow from the movies about the pirate. He had a very piratical quality with his earrings and his chains. But Vijay Malia represented something interesting beyond uh, his, uh, uh, his golden toilet and his exuberant personality, which was the problem that India began to grapple with, um, the links between its political and business elite, the problems of corruption and crony capitalism, which followed this rapid period of global um, integration. So here we have Mr. Malia in London, outside of the, the high court, um, pleading his case that he should not get extradited back to India to face various charges of corporate, shena uh, co corporate shenanigans, borrowing lots of money from state-backed banks, which he then didn't pay back when his airline and other business affairs collapsed. Vijay Malia was also a politician. He was a member of the Indian Upper House. Um, he sat on the committee that dealt with airlines as an industry. He cultivated political friends, and although he claims in all of this that he did nothing wrong, and, and he may be right, who are we to say? We'll see what the courts say. He represented a turn in Indian politics in which the, the elite, the business and the political elite were gradually and ever more uh, uh, w working closely together. Now, this is a story I'm sure that will not be familiar to anyone from Malaysia. Uh, why are you laughing? But it's a problem that, that India is still grappling with. When Narendra Modi was elected in 2014, and again, a second landslide in 2019, he was elected on a platform of clean governance, of trying to, to bring the, the tycoons to heel. There was a time when I arrived in India and in the years before when it seemed like Mumbai, the financial capital, ruled Delhi, the political capital. And to some degree, that balance has been reestablished under Modi, that, that Delhi is back in charge. Nonetheless, the power of the super-rich and the, the big 
business houses remains very substantial in India. And although the number of scams, the mega scams um, that happened before Modi came to power have gone down slightly, it's far from clear that India under Modi have managed to move, take a, a, a giant leap forward towards a different and cleaner model of governance, both for investors and in terms of perceptions of corruption, which in India are just as high as ever they were. And again, so this is the, the second theme of the book, the, the, the problem of crony capitalism and why it was that that also was related to India's re-globalization. As India's economy grew, as money came in from abroad, the value of being corrupt, the value of political power which could divide spoils went up hugely. And, and so it was a story both of plenty being created but also to some degree plenty being um, embezzled. This is particularly true in the political system. So India, if it isn't already, has the most expensive political system in the world. Um, very hard to estimate this, but $5 billion, one estimate suggested in 2014, seven or $8 billion in the last election. Um, if the second one is true, then that means India is already the world's most expensive political system. Almost all of that is donated under the table. Uh, so the, these are informal estimates. The, the amount that are donated officially is a, is a tiny fraction of that. And, and so this is a problem that India is yet to, to grasp that you know, the, the academic definition of crony capitalism is collusion between the business and the political elite. Um, and if you have this level of illicit funding of politics, there has at some level to be a quid pro quo. Uh, we just don't know exactly what it is. To some degree, the system has responded. These are, this is an image of the anti-corruption protests that happened in India um, about the time I arrived, 2011, 2012, which propelled Modi to office, and to some degree, as I will go on and argue later, India's democracy, its independent court system, its free and uh, voracious media has provided, in addition to Modi's actions, some check on the power of the tycoons and the rising tide of corruption. Nonetheless, there is still a great public dissatisfaction about governance and corruption, and that's something I'll come on to talk about in the, the second half. The third story that I wanted to highlight was about debt and the, the ambition of India's tycoon class. So this is an integrated manufacturing facility in Angul in the state of Orissa owned by another charismatic tycoon called Navin Jindal. And he, along with Mr. Malia, represented in a sense the, the ups and then the very rapid downs of India's tycoon class, particularly its industrial tycoons. This is Navin Jindal, again, uh, like um, Vijay Malia, a very charismatic figure, uh, a Congress party MP for a while, a lover of polo, uh, inheritor of a business from his father, and one that grew over this period of hyperglobalization with extraordinary uh, speed, moving into energy, coal mining, um, steel, a whole bunch of other uh, industries. This is where Angul is. One of the nice things about being an author in India is you get to cadge rides on people's private jets. So this is the private jet that I took with Naveen Jindal down to see uh, his facility. And this was the view from the very top of it. Um, you can see him here in his aviator sunglasses with Naveen Jindal written on the top of his hat. And I talk about this, I think it's in chapter nine of the book, that he looked out over this steel plant and and for a moment sighed and was rather sad. He looked out into the distance and said, over there, beyond that hill, that's where it is. That's what we came here for. And over beyond that hill was a coal field. He'd built all of this, this huge facility to be right next to a coal field that he had bought. And then because of the corruption backlash, uh, he and his companies uh, had been accused by anti-corruption campaigners and then by the government um, of not having bid for this properly. Um, and so he was denied access to the coal that he thought was rightfully his. And as a consequence of that, his business affairs came very close to collapse. And he, along with Vijay Malia and a whole host of the other tycoons, um, suffered from problems of debt, 
uh, and not being able to repay their debts, which in a sense are at the heart of India's economic troubles today. Again, this is something that should be familiar from recent history in this part of the world, a speculative investment boom fueled by ready, available, uh, ready availability of capital, very similar to what happened to the, in the Asian financial crisis in Malaysia and elsewhere in the late 1990s. Tycoons like Naveen Jindal got incredibly ambitious about the, the scale and speed that they wanted to build. Uh, in the process, bent some of the rules and have left India's corporate sector, the, the backbone of its corporate sector, with a huge debt burden that is still being repaid, and its banks with bad loans uh, that are still uh, meaning that India's current growth slowdown is a hangover from the boom that happened really in the middle to the late uh, uh, stages of the last decade. Here's the non-performing loan rate in India, much worse uh, than in China, uh, as bad as in almost any other country in the region. And part of the reason, again, why India has had such a weak private sector investment rate uh, since Modi was elected in 2014. So there you have it, three pictures of India, three tycoons to give you a sense of the story in the book. Let me make three sort of short points to try and link that to the themes of the conference, our collective brain. The first of which is about globalization. And, and before I make this, which is really about the risks of connection, I think it's important to pause and note that despite the prevailing air of pessimism about the last period of globalization uh, and associated problems of the trade war and the US and China and the potential decoupling of the two engines of the global economy, globalization remains very popular in this part of the world. You can see Malaysia up there in fifth place, but this part of the world did very well out of the period of hyper-globalization. Countries grew very rapidly, and if you ask the man on the street to the extent that they have an opinion, they think globalization was a force for good in the world, as opposed to my own benighted, struggling country, third from bottom, and God save the French, right at the very foot of the table. Um, you can see here this as well. This is a chart borrowed from The Economist. It shows basically the same issue. Um, the, the, the more your economy has grown during the period of hyper-globalization, the better you feel about globalization. And so before I make a negative point, I thought it was important to, to, to at least be reasonable about the period that we've just come from. This, in a sense, is the period of globalization that India benefited from, that China benefited from. This is a little bit difficult to read, but the blue line at the top is growth in global trade. The red line is growth in global GDP. And you can see that for most of the 20 or 30 years before the financial crisis, growth in global trade handily exceeded um, growth in the world economy overall. And what's happened after the financial crisis is that relationship has broken down. That's the, the, the narrative of deglobalization, globalization that you'll read about in the newspapers that is in a sense being accelerated by the problems of the trade war. Nonetheless, I think it's important to learn the lessons of this period, which is that although there were huge benefits from the period of, of rapid globalization, it clearly wasn't managed very well. It wasn't managed very well in the West, where a combination of dividing the pie unfairly between the rich and the West and a tin ear to problems of cultural change and migration led to the populist backlash with which we are all familiar. But it also wasn't managed very well in countries like India, where rapid re-entry into the global economy led to exactly the kind of speculative investment boom in the middle of the 2000s and the later 2000s in India that we saw in Asia in the run-up to the 97-98 crisis. The next period of globalization that we're going into is clearly going to be very different from the one that we have known. It's going to be based less on trade, on global standards, and American leadership, or trade in physical goods. It's going to be more driven by trade in digital goods. It will be more led and shaped by China, and Chinese rules, Chinese institutions, and Chinese systems. And it will be driven here in Asia by urbanization, and eventually by climate. And if we are going to manage to avoid the kind of backlash 
that's happened in the West and the sort of industrial collapse that you've seen in India, we clearly have to get much better at appropriately gauging the speed that globalization should proceed at and managing its social and political consequences. So this is a, a, an image of how Asia may one day be connected. We have to make sure that we're thinking much more carefully and learning the lessons of the previous era before we rush into the next. The second point I wanted to make was about state capacity. This is how I end the book. Um, this is an image of North Block in New Delhi, the, the governing heart of India, um, which hasn't in many ways changed very much from the time when this was also the governing heart of the, the British Empire. Um, the, the, the core of India's civil service remains high quality but understaffed, tiny in number, struggling to manage the extraordinary change that has come over the country. State capacity as an idea was one that I found quite useful in thinking about India's development. So Francis Fukuyama talks about state capacity as one of the critical drivers of economic development. It's also something you'll read in books like Why, Nation Fail, Why Nations Fail by Robinson and Asimoglu, the importance of high quality public institutions. Now state capacity isn't the same as good governance. It's not the same as clean, non-corrupt governance. China has fantastic state capacity, is very good at getting things done while also being phenomenally corrupt. India's problem is it has low state capacity and has had problems with bad governance. And so thinking about state capacity, in a sense the way that the state manages our collective intelligence, our collective brain, I think is a useful way of thinking about countries like India and other lower middle income economies around Asia, the major challenge that they take for the next stage of their economic development. It was very helpful for me to leave India and move to Singapore. Not just because Singapore is a very pleasant place to live with, you know, nice schools and that sort of thing, but because it managed, it helped me learn about the economic development process that the rest of Asia, uh, the rest of East Asia has been on over the last 20 or 30 years. And while there are many components to this, export focused manufacturing being one area that East Asia pioneered and where India is notably still weak and struggling, one consistent picture from Japan to South Korea to Taiwan to Singapore to Malaysia to Thailand was the development of high quality public institutions and the investment in those institutions to help manage the process of economic development. And so India's challenge, as much as being economic, is a challenge of developing improved state capacity. This is one of the more difficult charts in the deck to read. This is from a working paper from a Harvard academic called Lant Pritchard. Um, what it shows is that actually developing state capacity is much harder than you think. These are a universe of 100 nations, 100 developing nations over the last 20 or 30 years. Only about eight of them, those in green, eight to 10, are on track to follow Denmark, Sweden, Singapore, Japan in developing high quality public institutions over the next 20 or 30 years. The red is the really worrying thing, which is that while we might think that governments get gradually better and better over time, actually a little bit like the middle income trap, many countries get caught in what you might call a state capacity trap in which their attempts to improve their governments over time falter and reverse. And you can't quite see it, but Mal both Malaysia and India are in that negative middle box um, in, in which their state capacity is medium, but over recent history, there are signs that actually the quality of their public management has declined. Obviously, this came before the election in Malaysia uh, 18 months ago, and so this is more a reflection perhaps of what happened under the previous government uh, than the current government. Nonetheless, a focus on investing in state capacity um, is a hugely important challenge. But let me end just quickly with a little optimism about India's future. I said that I would talk about India and China, the great thumbsucker question. Can India repeat the successes that China has had? Can it grow 
anything like as fast as China did over the last two or three decades when China regularly posted growth of, 20 or 30, uh, of more than 10%. And I think the simple answer to that is no. India is not going to develop in that way. It's going to be a much more up and down journey, you know, two steps forward, one step back. That's the Indian way, and I think we have to get used to it. Nonetheless, there are strengths in the Indian political system that I think people don't recognize. So this was a graph developed by Arvind Subramanian, the former chief economic advisor of India, in which he compared the governance system of India and China. And the point to recognize here is that China is as much as India an outlier for economic development. If China is indeed to become uh, a rich economy with a increasingly neo-Leninist autocratic, some would say dictatorial system, it will be the first economy in history to have made that transition, or at least the first economy to do it without being an oil emirate. And, and so China is a test case, which is every other uh, major economy that has become rich, including autocratic Asian economies like South Korea, have at the stage that China reached become slightly more democratic. They become more liberal and more plural, and eventually most of them become democracies. So China's, China's path is, is a complicated one. India's system, its messy democracy, is typically viewed to be a weakness. But there's something in the words of Nicholas Taleb, there's something anti-fragile, something robust about India's democracy. It is adaptable, infuriating, but if I were to take a bet, if I were someone to bet me a hundred ringgit, which country would have the same political system in 30 years' time, India or China, I'd take India every day. I think it's a much more durable economic system and one that is much more likely to see India become uh, a rich economy by the middle of this century than China's current system is. So you can draw your own conclusions about this. I, I drew in my book a conclusion from history. So the subtitle of the book was A Journey Through India's New Gilded Age. Um, let me just flick back through this to show you these pictures. Ah, no, not that one, sorry. Uh, there we go, I'm flicking through the wrong way. If you look at pictures of uh, New York in, eight, in 1880, during the American Gilded Age, and you look at pictures of downtown Mumbai today, they look remarkably similar. And on a GDP per capita basis, India today and the United States in 1880 also uh, were about the same, about $2,000 per capita. And the more I thought about this comparison between Gilded Age America and Gilded Age India, the more attractive I found it. Gilded Age America was the era of the robber baron tycoons, of corrupt Tammany Hall politics, of a country that was originally an agrarian republic of yeoman farmers that very rapidly became an urban, middle-class, industrial economy, just in the way that India is becoming as, uh, at the moment. And so if you'd have looked at the United States in 1880, as many of America's own intellectual class in that period did, you would have despaired both at the nature of your business elite and your political elite. The business elite, the millionaire class, were seen to be rapacious and corrupt, irredeemable in their greed, the Rockefellers, the J.P. Morgans, the Carnegies. But over the next 20 or 30 years in the U.S., a range of political reforms were introduced which turned America's Gilded Age into what's called its progressive era. Uh, the size of its entrenched corporate elites were attacked by politicians, the trusts were broken up, uh, governance standards were improved, the mass media um, meant that it was harder for politicians to be corrupt, public institutions which went on to define America in the 20th century were built. And this is a pattern that you see in many countries where the early stages of industrialization come along with rapid wealth creation at the top, crony capitalism and debt and periodic booms and busts. But in America in the 1880s, in Britain in the early part of the 19th century, in South Korea in the 1960s, and in countries like Malaysia more recently, they have managed to move beyond this period 
through sensible political reforms, and I think India can do the same. I don't think it's a given, but I think, in a sense, India's destiny is in its own hands, and there's no reason to be pessimistic about India's future. And so that I will leave you with. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll invite Bharat back onto the stage.